So hello, this is the supplementary lecture for um, the age of globalization. So um, in the first two lectures, what I've done is to flesh out the general context. And now I'm going to look specifically at two specific commodities that are central to how we can think about art in relation to trade. So uh, the first of this, as you see on your screen, is really um, textile. Um, when we think about textile, um, I think there are a few things that you need to uh, be aware of. Uh, firstly, it's that um, the material itself, cotton, was produced in parts of Southeast Asia since at least the 13th century. Uh, mostly, uh, these are areas that cotton uh, is cultivated are areas that has a marked dry season. So this includes uh, like Luzon uh, in the Philippines, central Vietnam, or eastern Cambodia, East Java, and central Burma. And uh, while uh, cotton would become one of the key ingredients uh, in the making of uh, the textile tradition of Southeast Asia, uh, let's not also forget that for uh, most of uh, Southeast Asia people, Historically, uh, they would be wearing a lot of bark cloth and uh, cloth or fabric that is made of banana fiber. Okay, so uh, Chinese records do, do show that cotton is one of the main exports from the places mentioned above. Uh, some of the most productive sites, such as Burma, exported up to a thousand tons during, to Yunnan uh, during the 17th century, for example. Uh, of course, uh, places, the smaller uh, production uh, centers like Bali and the south of Sulawesi uh, did also export raw cotton uh, around the region. Therefore, by the 16th century, I think you, you have a sense that this was a commodity that was this was a material that was widely traded. It also meant that uh, there was a huge demand in turning cotton into textile, and therefore Southeast Asian in many ways are serious fashionistas and would uh, spend a lot of money investing in dressing up and accessorizing themselves. And I think uh, in a way that Southeast Asians are uh, house proud, uh, they're also very fashion conscious. And, and clothes and clothing seems to be a very important part of uh, Southeast Asian culture, uh, even taking on ritualistic and, uh, and spiritual dimensions uh, to it. So uh, by and large, however, when it comes to spinning and weaving, it's pretty much something that was done in the household, mostly by women. Uh, using backstrap looms, and these, of course, cannot really compete with the scale of production uh, uh, when it comes to, uh, you know, competing with, for example, what India was making. Uh, so, in, in this sense, while uh, there were areas in Southeast Asia that was suitable for cotton cultivation, uh, the industry of turning cotton into textile was very much a household matter. And one of the distinguishing feature, if we look at the, the textile arts that came from within Southeast Asia is how laborious it is to actually create these uh, works, especially with the use of the double ikat uh, technique that have become uh, a, uh, very much connected to the labor intensive uh, and an and, and intricate process of uh, dyeing and producing uh, a, a very particular type of weave in uh, fabric design. So as a result, um, if the domain of textile production was uh, such an exclusive domain and, and very much an a take undertaking that has uh, other spiritual and ritualistic dimensions, uh, by and large, the trade, uh, 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 the trading of textile therefore allows for different types of cloth material to be in circulation across Southeast Asia. And because there's a huge demand for fashion, uh, Indian cloth stepped in uh, to fulfill this demand. 
because it was so much cheaper uh, to buy an Indian cloth, it soon became the most widely circulated uh, form of uh, commodity across Southeast Asia. Um, so what is Indian cloth known for? It uh, has a reputation for its brilliant colors. So uh, colors that are not often available in Southeast Asian dyes. Moreover, because of the scale and the uh, and, and the developed uh, industry uh, that uh, that churns out these Indian cloth, uh, it, it could also be uh, Indian cloth uh, could also be much more cheaper than local cloth, uh, right? And and this trade has been going on since at least the fifth century. So before spices or precious gems, metals, animal parts from Southeast Asia was exported. Uh, Indian cloth was likely the first item that Southeast Asians wanted uh, in exchange for these precious goods that India wanted from Southeast Asia. And, you know, by the 16th century, there was so much of these cloth being traded uh, in Southeast Asia. Uh, that an estimate uh, suggests that, you know, uh, uh, annually, I think the trade uh, racks up to about 20 million square feet of cloth. To put the things into perspective, that's a new sarong for every Southeast Asian every three years. Uh, so if you put yourself back in time, that's a, a huge volume of trade. All you have to do is remember that this was before high street fashion and clothes that's been made by machines and cheap labor in Bangladesh, right? So if you're willing to spend uh, so much money on cloth, uh, uh, a new sarong every three years, uh, that's an indication that perhaps you are a serious fashionista. Um, in this way, Southeast Asian cloth made its way across Southeast Asia. And though the trade focused very much on urban centers, these urban centers really are marketplaces that serve as a crossroad. And in this way, Indian cloth also reach further inland. So for example, what you see on the screen here is uh, a textile from the Coromandel Coast. And this is traded to the Toraja people in Sulawesi. And in the Torajan context, this would be used as ceremonial cloth and being passed down from one generation to another as a type of sacred heirloom a mawa, or in the Malay language, we call it a uh, pusaka. Uh, in this way, uh, the Coromandel producers of these textiles were also trying to meet the aesthetic demand of uh, its buyers, right? Uh, uh, so, for example, here we see the tree of life motif being flanked by animals. And this type of motif clearly have a strong appeal in Indonesia. Previously, we've already explored how the Tree of Life is a enduring mythical symbol that is closely connected to the ship-shaped uh, uh, cosmology of Southeast Asia. And therefore, uh, in many ways, um, uh, artisans from the Coromandel Coast uh, were creating textiles, uh, although they draw from aesthetic and sensibility that is uh, Indian in, 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 in the way that uh, these are established iconographies and patterns uh, and motifs common to uh, you know, uh, the Indian craft tradition. Uh, nevertheless, uh, they translate and found new appeal in the context of Southeast Asia, principally uh, on the count that they also spoke and met the demands of Southeast Asia and allowed for Southeast Asians to create their own meaning out of these objects that they purchased from, uh, from across the seas. So uh, here is an example. Uh, if, we, if we looked at, for example, uh, statuaries that have come down to us from the 13th century, uh, from, uh, from the Singhasari, Singhasari kingdom, uh, you would find that uh, uh, there are indications uh, of motifs that are also discovered in a, a range of different uh, locales uh, across Asia. Uh, and this suggests perhaps that 
a motif such as uh, the one that you see on the screen here. So th this motif takes the appearance of a da, uh, yeah, faintly registering on, as a relief on the uh, a statue of Pavarti in uh, the Singhasari sculpture. Uh, you can also see uh, equivalent uh, appearance of this duck motif in, for example, a 12th century Sikh silk fragment that has been excavated from the Tunhuang Caves uh, uh, in the northwestern part of China. Uh, then there are also uh, silk fabrics uh, with embroidered duck in uh, Iran, as well as uh, Indian examples connected to uh, Jainism. So in another instance, uh, we see in this very famous statue of uh, Prachna Paramita uh, uh, that was excavated from also Singhasari. The statue dates to the 13th century. Uh, it is speculated that uh, the Prachna Paramita is also depicting at the same time a it's serving as a deified portrait of a queen, though this is something that is uh, contested in current scholarship. Now, uh, there are two historical figures that have in the past been linked to the statue. One of them is uh, Queen Ken Bedes, the first queen and consort of Ken Arok, uh, who is uh, well known as the first king of the Singhasari uh, kingdom, or uh, alternatively, uh, another speculation suggests that this could be a deified portrayal of Queen Gayati, Gayatri Rajapatni, uh, Rajapatni uh, who was the consort of Radhan Vijaya of Kartarajasa, uh, who is known as the first king of uh, Majapahit, the kingdom that came after uh, and succeeded Singhasari in terms of power and influence. So this is one of the most treasured uh, collection in the National Museum in Indonesia. If you have a chance to visit Jakarta, be sure to pay the museum a visit. Uh, it's a great opportunity to uh, have a close-up view of this uh, statue because the images don't do justice to how intricate uh, the reliefs. Um, here uh, in this central image, you get an idea that uh, the texture of the textile that is wrapping around uh, the body of the deity uh, is uh, something that is readily identifiable. So in fact, scholars have connected this to uh, the larger uh, textile trade uh, that saw uh, the demand for Indian patola cloth. The popularity of this motif uh, is in many ways evidenced by uh, it's uh, how it's been registered in the statue of Prajna Paramita, but also uh, this is a motif that was widely adopted into various uh, textile traditions in Southeast Asia, including uh, Bate, uh, where it became known as the uh, Chaplot motif, one of the uh, uh, foundational motifs uh, in uh, Bate production. Uh, so, but you know, and when we talk about uh, the early price cloth uh, in Indonesia, uh, most of them were primarily bought for the purpose of, uh, you know, as part of a bridal attire. And therefore, uh, uh, in the early stages at least, it was only the nobility uh, uh, that could afford the patola. Uh, and this is specifically priced because it's a, a type of double ikat textile made in Gujarat. Uh, and, that, uh, and the, the process of creating a double ikat is so time-consuming, laborious, and uh, really a show of technical mastery of uh, weaving. Uh, and, and, uh, uh, and due to this sort of like demand, uh, when the Dutch uh, was trying to establish its trade, trade presence in, uh, uh, in our part of the world, uh, they soon realized the commercial potential uh, of this patola textile and tried very hard to secure this market, okay? So uh, often in Indonesia, there were three designs that were popular. So there were those with elephants, then there were also those elephants alternating with tigers, as well as those uh, uh, that uh, 
is primarily geometric patterns based on flower motifs with varying degrees of abstraction. Okay. So uh, when the first mentioned design, uh, such uh, the elephant design, for example, was really something that was produced prior to the Dutch monopoly. Uh, so prior to and after the monopoly, in fact, uh, this design uh, with the elephant was something that uh, had always been highly popular uh, and was in demand uh, uh, because of its royal sort of significance to the native. So uh, the elephant was uh, in many uh, parts of Southeast Asia also seen as a karamat, uh, so imbued with certain sense of power. Uh, uh, so, but it is the third Patola design, the ones with all the geometric flowers, that over time gain wider circulation, primarily because it lacked royal significance. It was also something that was popular amongst like European settlers, therefore uh, something that became uh, adaptable because there was, uh, 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 there was a there, there was widespread appeal and, uh, and a desire for uh, the East India Company to actually reproduce this design uh, and grow this market. So the moment that the textile trade was monopolized by the East India Company, the first thing that uh, the VOC did was really to produce native look, uh, inspired Indonesian textiles for the European market often by modifying the original pattern and then integrating it with a more uh, common European sensibility or style or aesthetic. So in this way, Indonesian villages and cultures' uh, 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 significance were uh, uh, slowly abandoned uh, while the European versions modified the original pattern. In a different way, uh, in various Indonesian communities were also uh, modifying and innovating on uh, this uh, imported textile. If you would dig a bit deeper, uh, what you'll find is that in moments of uh, trade disruption, in cases of war, for example, uh, this is where uh, the local um, craftsmen step up uh, uh, to fulfill an ongoing demand for textile. And this is where you also see the modification, the innovation uh, happening. Um, Batek's history, therefore, in many ways, uh, can be thought through this lens as well. And while the origins of Batek is something that is unconfirmed, uh, really, when it comes to serious advancement in its production, this can be traced back to the 17th century, uh, where uh, you see increased prominence uh, in uh, the production of Javanese pate uh, and its appearance within a domestic archipelagic trade, you know. So while India's textile once dominated 25% of the world's trade, uh, through uh, various kinds of like uh, technological advances and the economic policies set up by uh, uh, all the, uh, the English and the Dutch colonial powers, uh, this slowly ate away India's preeminence as a center for production and export of textile. Uh, ultimately, it decimated India until it became a mere supplier of raw cotton to India. Uh, and at the same time, you know, this was when England in the 18th century uh, uh, became industrialized with the invention of machines that are now able to produce at a mass scale. England was able to sell the cloth uh, made by England back to India and also to much of Southeast Asia. And as a result, uh, this uh, in many ways enabled uh, batik production uh, at least uh, and enabled the batik to fulfill the kind of artistry that batik was, uh, batik sort of like hope to, batik makers hope to achieve, uh, principally because uh, the cotton that was produced uh, by the machine is infinitely 
uh, had much more smoother surface and this was much prized when it comes to a painting uh, on textile tradition that required you to handle the, uh, the, the, the pen, the, the, the wax funnel uh, with not only great speed but with a kind of patient control uh, in order to produce the pattern that you see uh, on the screen here. So there is this document, got documentary, a short one that I, uh, uh, you know, I'm highlighting here. Uh, perhaps this is something that you can watch on your at your free time. I'm going to include the link in uh, the uh, the course outline. Okay, um, so just have a, uh, a a watch. It really concerns the symbolism of uh, a bate within a court tradition. Uh, so very often when we talk about the history of Bate, uh, we often think of the court tradition as uh, exemplifying what is authentic and what is like uh, indigenous about Bate. When in fact, uh, I think it's perhaps much more interesting to think of Bate in relation to uh, the political economy of uh, 18th century Indonesia, uh, as well as also uh, the longer history that uh, Bate is connected to principally this long distance uh, textile trade tradition and how its disruption resulted in the emergence of Bate as well. Uh, so as you see here, uh, if the court is a thought of as that conservative institution that preserve what is authentic about Japanese Bate, uh, you see a different kind of aesthetic playing out in uh, the coastal area. So the court tradition Bate tends to take on a much more somber tone. Uh, using natural dye, it normally takes on the, a, a brownish kind of appear, appearance, a color, and, and that's, uh, that's considered as uh, something that is ideal. Uh, on aesthetic grounds, right? Uh, whereas the garishness of the coastal Bate tradition was rather much frowned upon. Uh, and this also extends to uh, the, 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 the type of composition that you see uh, in compare in comparison to a court Bate. So uh, after having viewed the video, you should have a sense that uh, there's a lot more emphasis on symmetry uh, with a pad down kind of pattern and then gets repeated infinitely. Uh, so the idea is that the pattern takes on uh, uh, the qualities of uh, being arabesque in, in the sense that it is uh, a, a form that can be infinitely repeatable and extendable uh, uh, even beyond the, 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 the cloth itself, okay? Uh, uh, so you see that kind of like design principle also informing coastal bate. However, there's a much greater uh, 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 emphasis on uh, one's ability to play uh, uh, with this shallow or almost two-dimensional pictorial feel. Uh, and what you get is get a sense of is that. Uh, because the coastal communities never had uh, tied or connected Bate to uh, a ritualistic or proprietary sort of like uh, uh, set of customs and tradition, it was also uh, a space where um, different uh, makers, uh, and these would be makers coming from various communities, not only Javanese, you have the Arab, you have the Europeans uh, living in uh, the East Indies, and also the Chinese, all participating in, uh, in, in really pushing what is pictorially possible uh, on the batik cloth, right? Uh, so as a result of that, uh, uh, you'd find that uh, it is something that was manufactured by different communities and each community really lends their own aesthetic sensibility into how they decide to compose um, uh, uh, the design of uh, 
the, the batik that they were making. Uh, you know, uh, the one on the left, for example, is a uh, the Chinese Wu Yi cloud. That then, uh, over time, became uh, also a very established uh, batik motif called the uh, Mega Mendo. Uh, right? So the great the cloud, right? Uh, uh, you know, on the one hand, it can be a schematic uh, uh, interpretation of a, a, a graphic convention that came from, you know, uh, a neighboring country. At the same time, in the coastal area, you also find much more whimsical uh, depictions of uh, uh, visual culture that is contemporaneous to 19th century Dutch East Indies world. So in a highly hierarchized hierarchical sort of like world where, uh, you know, space itself is uh, divided uh, along uh, and, and heavily regulated according to ethnic lines. Uh, and, and over the course of the 19th century, um, uh, ideas connected to uh, racial purity then were slowly gaining uh, increasing importance uh, it, when you see uh, the kind of collision that is at play on the surface of a bate like this, it is in some ways trying to subvert uh, the highly rigid manner in which societies are organized along, you know, the colonial discourse or the imperial discourse uh, that saw essentially the separation of human beings into various uh, into a hierarchy based on this idea of race uh, here instead. One sense that, uh, you know, a slippage is, has occurred. Uh, the world has turned upside down and, you know, the masters are now servants, the servants are now masters. And it is a kind of theater in its own chaotic manner, right? Uh, where different things uh, are, are brought together uh, to paint a, a social life that is uh, that makes port cities such vibrant uh, places. Now compare this to the design schema of say a Kraton Bate or a palace Bate uh, from central central uh, Java. Uh, they almost uh, you know uh, possess or express opposing aesthetic principles. Right uh, on the one hand. Uh, one is centered on projecting this sense of order, and this order stems from a kind of belief in uh, the the power of um, uh, the monarch, uh, and not only the monarch, but the monarch within a mandala polity that, uh, that recognizes or the monarch at the center of this field of power that radiates outwards from his being, right? Uh, uh, in many ways, the Kawong motif is an expression of that. It is uh, a recognition of the seed uh, through which uh, different types of patterns and permutations are able to grow out of this one point uh, of uh, uh, a uh, dot, for example. Uh, so here, what you see is there is no sort of sense of where about its origin, and there's no sort of like uh, deference towards uh, you know the the rules of uh, you know aesthetic refinement or the need to conform to specific types of uh, motif and uh, you know or or at least uh, uh, you know acknowledgement that there are sumptuary laws governing what can or cannot be depicted. A lot of the Kraton motifs are forms of larangan, meaning they are forbidden uh, to, uh, for normal people to actually wear uh, those motifs. Whereas here, this is a much more democratic space. It is also a space that reaches outwards and its influence stretches all the way to places like Japan. So in, uh, in uh, part of like, you know, the Edo period, there are also uh, pictures from Nagasaki, which is the only port city where the Dutch were allowed to trade in Japan and uh, amongst all the European powers, the Dutch were the only ones that were permitted to trade uh, alongside with China, of course. Uh, a number of these interesting woodblock prints that were made in 
Nagasaki actually uh, uh, show uh, Dutchmen uh, in Nagasaki uh, often accompanied by uh, what is known as his uh, Kurobo. Uh, uh, this translates as black servant. So the characters on the screen therefore in many ways are what you call tight portraits. What they don't record are actual people, rather they show the types of people that uh, used to be found in a port city like Nagasaki. So slavery was uh, very common back then. Um, it wasn't uh, out of the ordinary uh, and it wasn't only uh, the white population in this part of the world that owned slaves. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, slave ownership was uh, uh, was prevalent uh, even amongst local aristocrats and those who are well off enough to simply own another human being, right? Um, so uh, pay attention to uh, what the servant is wearing. When you put the two images side to side, you get a sense that uh, the fabric is really vibrant and and you also sense that there is a pattern, uh, serially reproduced pattern uh, that is printed on the fabric. Uh, in many ways, uh, it's a really good indication uh, that suggests that what they were wearing are bate. Uh, so when we find bate in, you know, uh, woodblock prints such as this that dates back to the 18th century or the early 19th century, it really gives you an idea of Bate's global circulation that if we were to think of the history of Bate uh, being part of this longer history that is connected to uh, cross-regional trade and exchange of goods and objects, uh, you know, from Southeast Asia to different parts of the world, then uh, it is only natural that when we want to write a history of um, but they, uh, uh, this larger history in which the cloth itself uh, participates within a long distance relay and exchange of goods uh, helps us to at least frame the story of textile and situate uh, textile as something that is uh, unique in the way that it expresses uh, both uh, the sacrosanct in, uh, in how it's a large part of its meaning is derived from uh, rituals and its ceremonial use, but at the same time, it is also a material object that has strong commodity value. And who's to really say that these two fields are mutually exclusive to one another? In fact, by considering them in close proximity, I think what uh, Bate is uh, perhaps compelling us to think about is that uh, the value, whether it's um, uh, material value or economic value versus spiritual or or, or social are, are not always uh, unentangled. And in fact, its entanglement suggests, uh, 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 might suggest that we perhaps need to sort of find a much more nuanced way to account uh, what, how meaning, how value is expressed and understood through material objects uh, in our part of the world uh, that doesn't discount with the economic dimensions, nor does it underplay the ritualistic and the social dimensions.